Okay, so in these lectures, I want to talk about the issue of personal identity. And I think before we get into it, we need to do a bit to kind of introduce this issue to show both what it means and why it's important. Um, because I think issues, you know, debates about personal identity can get really involved really abstract really quickly and it starts to sometimes become hard to see well why is this important why should we care what does it even mean um and i think you know part of the reason this is important one of the reasons i follow the death unit with this pretty directly is that it's a way to answer questions about you know could we conceivably survive death you know, saying what personal identity is will help us to maybe see how we should answer this question. And also, you know, I think it'll help us to decide, well, what would it even mean to survive death? What would count as that? You know, what would have to be true? What would have to be the case for someone to have really survived death? So, so let's look at a few ways this question comes up, right? You know, because I think in normal context, it might seem, you know, kind of nonsensical, kind of just obvious if I say, well, am I still me, right? Well, of course you are, right? That's, that's a weird question. But let, let's think of some of the cases we looked at in the last unit, right? So let's take Barbara Carlin. And, you know, look, I'm, I'm going to be agnostic about whether she really has Anne Frank's memories or not, right? I don't know. I don't, I honestly tend not to believe in reincarnation, but I'm not really sure. I don't know. There's reason to think maybe Carlin is deluded, you know, she was an imaginative kid, you know, we don't have a lot of verification for her stories besides her, you know, further, you know, she wrote some books from this, this made some money, I'm a cynic. I'm always suspicious when people make money from something, right? But let's just assume that she really had Anne Frank's memories. I'm, I'm a bit dubious of this, but let's assume she does, right? For the sake of argument. If that is true, would she then really be Anne Frank? If somehow, through some means we don't understand, you know, she has Anne Frank's memories. Is she really Anne Frank? And I mean, we might be tempted to say yes, but are we really so sure about that, right? You know, even Carlin, they ask her at the end of, you know, the interview, well, who are you? Well, I'm Barbara Carlin, right? That's, that's the person I am. You can ask the same question for, you know, if you're a little suspicious about the Carlin case, I think Lamb uses it because it's, you know, Anne Frank, we all know who she is. It's good. I don't know what you'd say for a podcast. I guess I was about to say it's good TV. I guess I would say it's good radio, right? It's good podcast. You know, but, but think about the case of James, right? This kid, he seems to remember being a fighter pilot in the Battle of Iwo Jima is he then that person, right? Um, and I will say, if you guys are interested in this issue, um, the institute that, that Tucker from the Hi-Fi Nation episode leads was actually founded by this guy, Ian Stevenson. Um, he was a psychiatrist, researcher, got interested in the issue of reincarnation, did a lot of work, led this institute at UVA for years and years and years, studying reincarnation, trying to find evidence for it, right? He published, in, I think he published a few books, but I mean, his most famous one is 20 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation. And, you know, if you don't like the Carlin case, if the James case is not sketched out enough for you guys, you know, check out Stevenson's 20 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation. He's a pretty skeptical guy. He, you know, tries to bring scientific research to bear, and he gives you these 20 cases that he thinks, you know, provides some evidence for reincarnation, right? Children with memories of past lives that are, he tries to independently verify their accuracy. I, you know, look, I don't know what to do with this. Like I said, I'm not convinced of reincarnation, 
But the Stevenson one, if you don't believe in reincarnation, if you're me and you actually don't want to believe in it, the Stevenson is pretty unsettling. I'll tell you that from having read it maybe about 20 years ago, right? Anyway, so think about those cases. If it's true that someone can have memories of someone who's lived before, would we really say they are that person, right? I mean, look, we tend to make that leap. Should we really do that, though, right? Or take another way that personal identity comes up. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about this, but you get a lot of these transhumanist guys, they call themselves, um, talk about the singularity. Basically, people who want to live forever by downloading their memories and personality to a computer, right? Um, I think one of the more famous ones is Ray Kurzweil, who I'm going to talk about a lot, probably pick on a bit. You know, Kurzweil, if you've ever seen Being John Malkovich, and a lot of you probably haven't, if you've ever seen it, there's a, there's a guy in the film who's taking all these supplements, who's trying to live long enough to download his consciousness to John Malkovich. It's a weird movie. But I think they're making fun of Kurzweil, right? Kurzweil is fanatically taking all these supplements, starving himself, exercising, trying to live long enough to download his consciousness to a computer when we get to that point, which he thinks we will, right? Now look, though. Imagine we do get to that point. Imagine that somebody like Ray Kurzweil really could scan his brain, download the personality to a computer in the same way that I can download all the old stuff from one laptop to the next, right? Would the computer program be Ray Kurzweil? Would that really count as surviving death? If I, you know, if we download our memory personality to a computer, is that really going to be us? I mean, Ray Kurzweil seems to think it would. A lot of other people assume it, right? But I think there's a question here, you know. If I download everything on one desktop to another, well, what do I have? I have a new desktop with some old programs on it. I don't have literally my old desktop. So are these guys really right about that, right? It's another way the issue of personal identity comes in. Our answer to these questions, our definition of personal identity will determine if guys like Kurzweil are really talking sense when they say, well, we can survive by scanning and downloading our consciousness to a computer. One other sort of case where this comes up um, is in cases of amnesia. And what I have in mind here is so-called Hollywood amnesia. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't know that they do this as much. This used to be a trope of movies and TV shows. Um, someone gets bonked on the head, they forget who they are, hijinks ensue, they get bonked on the head again, they remember, right? It does not work that way in real life. In real life, different kinds of amnesia, some of it caused by like trauma, people go into what they call a fugue state, they might forget who they are. That's usually temporary. There's different kinds of amnesia, you know, forgetting that it's caused by brain injury. A lot of those tend to be permanent. Some of them aren't. But I will say to you, despite what you might see in some really lousy 60s sitcom, nobody, to my knowledge, ever had their memory restored by getting hit in the head again, right? That is some, even by the standards of lazy, stupid 60s sitcom writing, that is some lazy, stupid writing. Anyway, it is in fact very rare, though, for people to really forget who they are fundamental stuff about themselves. Even people with brain injuries, they'll forget some things. They might have trouble forming new memories. This Hollywood amnesia where it's like, I don't know who I am or anything about myself, that is super rare. It does happen, though. Um, there was a really interesting and I think disturbing, also, you know, well, Disturbing, interesting, you know, the woman later overcome it, so maybe in some sense inspiring. But there was a case of this um, that the Washington Post reported on a few years ago. 
maybe more like 10 or 15 now, right? I'm getting old a few, yeah, it, it seems like less than it was. But anyway, it's the case of this woman, Sue Mech, S-U-M-E-C-K. If you guys want to look her up, you Google it. I think the original Post article and probably some other stuff will pop up. Sue Mech gets hit on the head with a ceiling fan. I don't know, I don't know exactly how this, I can't remember how it happened, but it fell, it hits her on the head. She has some brain damage. She's in a coma for a bit. When she wakes up, she literally does not remember who she is. Does not remember who she is, does not recognize her husband, other family members, or her children. Has absolutely no memory of the person she was before the accident. Had to relearn a lot of basic stuff, too. Um, and here's the question. Is Sue Mech really the same person as she was before the accident? You know, you know look, her husband stayed with her. Um, but what would we say if he hadn't, right? You know, what would we say? You know, somebody who just leaves their wife or husband because they have an accident, we'd probably say, well, you're not a great person. That's a, that's a lousy thing to do, right? But if her husband had left and he said, well, look, it would be bad to leave my wife, but this woman has no memory of me, no memory of being my wife, none of that. I don't think she is the same person. She has the same body, but my wife is gone, whoever this person might be. Now, again, her husband didn't say that, but if somebody did say that, would we think it's crazy to say that? Are they really the same person? Should we treat them as the same person if they have absolutely no memory, right? I think in cases like Max, which are, are granted very rare, but do happen, we might ask, well, are they the same person? That is not a nonsensical question and an account of personal identity should help us answer that. You know, some other things here that I think are important to keep in mind, you know, should we hold someone responsible for actions committed long in the past when there's a different personality and values, right? I mean, think of this at a really extreme case. Imagine someone commits a crime before they can be brought to justice, brought to trial. Imagine they had an accident like Max, right? You know, she never committed a crime. She never did any of that. But imagine someone had and they suffer an accident like that before they can ever be convicted of anything. They don't remember the crime. They don't remember even being the person who committed it. Should we hold them responsible for it? Or would that just be cruel? You were punishing this person for something that somebody else did, right? I mean, look, you know, we get less extreme cases of this. Somebody commits a crime when they're 16. You know, usually there's a statute of limitations, but for some things like murder, there's not. They go on and live a life and then they catch them when they're 70 and they say, well, I'm not the same person I am was then. Usually we tend to treat that as kind of metaphorical, but some people might think there's really something to it, right? If your personality has changed so radically, if your values have changed so radically, are you still the same person in a sense that makes it justifiable to hold you responsible for those past actions? In the case of amnesia, it seems perfectly sensible to ask that if we really think the person has amnesia and isn't just, say, faking to avoid punishment, right? But even in cases where there's no amnesia, nothing weird, if there's just enough gap in time, that doesn't seem crazy, right? You know, same thing. You know, this seems to be lurking in the background of Williams's argument. Would someone who lives long enough to completely change their values and personality still be you, right? If you somehow live for 10,000 years and you couldn't even remember your earlier self and your values were completely different, would you still be the same person? Williams says not. 
He just tends to say, well, that's just obvious. You wouldn't be the same person. I'm much more willing to just throw my hands up and say, well, I don't know. <laughs> right? Even Williams. That's one of the reasons I didn't give you guys the article. It's really long. But it's interesting, but it's kind of sloppy because Williams just kind of assumes, well, you would be. Well, it's not obvious. Sorry, you wouldn't be to Williams. And to me, it's not obvious that you would be if you lived that long, changed your values, forgot who you were. But it's also not obvious to me you wouldn't be, right? It just seems that's an open question. That'd be a good thing to figure out. Okay. So that's the question of personal identity. And that's why it's interesting and important for cases like these. To put the question simply, personal identity is the question, what makes you, you? Another way to put this, what, what is it that makes you the same person over time? What is it that makes you the same person now that you were 10 years ago or five years ago or five days ago? In all these cases, we'll assume you are the same person, but why is that? How do we account for that, right? So in the next few lectures, I want to talk about the main theories of personal identity. Um, so there's dualism, what I'm going to call physicalism, and I want to be clear, there's another thing we might mean by physicalism, but I'll just use this as physicalism in one sense, and the memory theory. So dualism is this theory that the mind and the body are really different things. The mind, which dualists will often to a greater or lesser extent equate with the soul, will say, you know, dualists will say the mind, well, that's what's important. The way they think of the mind is pretty analogous to the way most of us think of the traditional concept of a soul, right? It's this thing that's correlated with a body, that's attached to a body in some way, but it is separable and it could, they think, in some way survive the body dying, right? The soul is what makes you who you are. If your soul was somehow attached to a different body, that would still be you according to the dualists. They might even say, you know, some of them might even think, well, the soul could survive without a body. They would also think, well, that's still you, right? Physicalism emphasizes the body, right? Physicalists will tend to say the body is all there is. This idea of some separate soul stuff makes no sense. And what is it that makes you the same person? You have the same body, right? Both of these theories have a bit of common sense punch, right? Often we tend to think in terms of souls. I don't know if that's just something about our culture or if it's something deep about human nature, whatever, but we often tend to think, well, persons and souls, that's a natural view for a lot of us, right? In the same way, physicalism, you know, how do, you know, think of the criteria we apply to everything else in the world. Is my cup I'm drinking coffee from this morning the same one I drank coffee from yesterday? Well, if it is physically the same object, yes. If it's not, it's not. It might be a cup that looks like it, but it's not the same cup, right? Physicalists just apply the criteria we use for everything else in the world to persons and personal identity. Finally, there's the memory theory. And I put this one as 3 and 3B three because I think 3 and 3B three are related, but they're not quite the same thing. There's memory and then there's psychological continuity. So the memory theory, it says... You know, memory or the right sort of psychological relation is what makes you the same person over time. Why are you still the person you were when you were 13? Well, because you can remember being 13, right? 
You don't remember everything, but you remember enough. Psychological continuity is a little more complicated, right? For reasons I'll get into. Part of psychological continuity is it expands out over memory, right? I'll say, well, there's memory and that's part of it. There's also, you know, continuity, something constant in your personality, your values, your whatever, your psychological profile, right? Why I separate out psychological continuity is that a lot of times people who like this theory will say, well, personal identity is not what we should be interested in. It's not whether we're literally the same person over time. The question we should be answering is how much psychological continuity is there? That's what makes it make sense for us to care about the survival of a future person to hold people responsible, so on and so forth. We'll delve deeper into that, but just realize that's the reason I separate them off. Psychological continuity, a lot of times people who offer this theory will say, it's not a theory of personal identity exactly, and the whole question of personal identity is in a way mistaken. We'll have to see what that means as we get more deeply into these three other theories and see, you know, some of the difficulties that they have.